We turn now to our sermon text in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. This should be a familiar passage to you. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have probably heard a sermon or two preached concerning the sacrifice that God called upon Abraham to make. A very stunning event. Very stunning. Shall we stand for the reading of God's word, please? If you are able, beloved, only if you're able. As I read, beloved, remember, this, this, these are not merely the words of men. It's not merely the words of Moses. This is the word of the living God that he gave to us by the inspiration of his Holy Spirit that we might learn of him. Because these things are spiritually discerned. Many have read the Bible and have not known the Lord. We need God's Spirit. May he guide us now. Give ears to his word, I pray. And now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abram and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. I'm sorry, I should have said, I use the new King James, so if that's King James, it'll be a little different in places, but it's pretty close. Okay, I'm sorry about and he tells him, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Whew. You know, really, this is a real event, beloved. And I, I stop, and I know some pastors don't like it when you stop in the reading of God, but, whew. you know, this is like the book of Revelation, which means the unveiling. Do you understand what he's saying to Abraham to do? The magnitude of this? All of us put ourselves in that place as we hear the rest of this passage. He's told Abraham to offer his only son. The son of promise. The son that came in his old age when others laughed at him. That it couldn't possibly happen. That Sarah's womb was dried up. But no, God gave them that child, didn't she? That's what we have here. So that's, that's the setting of what's now to take place in this. We continue. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted it out, his eyes, and he saw the place from afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, the lad, and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. In the Hebrew, it's very careful here what he's doing. It's very precise. He says, and he laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, look, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering?" And Abram said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And so the two of them went together. And then they came to the place which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And so he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad. 
and do anything to him. For I know now that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. There behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And so Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and as the sand on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed the voice, the voice of the Lord. And so Abraham returned to his young men. And they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. May God bless the reading of this, his holy and his infallible word. Please be seated, beloved. To me, this, this passage is of such paramount importance because of the magnitude of the theology here contained. If you had no other passage in the Old Testament, this would do to teach to you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it tells us that we need a sacrifice in our place. We need a substitute. And it tells us that only God can provide that substitute. And that that substitute is his only son. His only begotten son. And that is Jesus and Jesus alone. Only he could be that acceptable sacrifice to the Lord God. Only he. You know, we often talk about going to church and coming to church and wanting to get people to go to church. Let's not lose sight about what is it really? It's not just going to church. It's going to be with Christ. It's going to be with God in fellowship with him and with his people. And we exalt him in our midst this day. You know, in our, in our English Bibles, at least it used to be, I haven't kept up on all the translations, but that the words Lord, L-O-R-D, and God, when printed in all capital letters, in our English Bible, refers to what we would try to pronounce, scholars you know, debate on it. The old school was Jehovah with the Puritans. That's the way I grew up, so to say. So I kind of lean that way. And then the, the newer is with Yahweh. But, you know, the Jews didn't pronounce it after a while. They would not say the name of God. They were afraid they would take God's name in vain. I think we've gone the other direction. The regard for God's name is in low esteem even among the Lord's people sometimes. You know, I, tra I traveled the world. Last year it was 50,000 miles. It's getting a little tired. <laughs> but I, I always think, well, at least I'm in an airplane and I'm not on a ship or, you know, on a wagon train or some other, or horseback, like some have traveled of old, you know, so it's nothing to complain about. But... You know, I, I visit other cultures, and I, I work among Muslim cultures, very different from ours, radically so. And one of the things you would never, never do as a Muslim is take the Quran and set it on the floor. And yet, watch what happens to Bibles. And I know, I mean, it's not to be by the letter of the law, but it's just like, boy, we need to be careful to 
cherish our Bibles. Uh, one of our churches in their vacation Bible school just raised $1,500 to buy Bibles for our field in Nepal for Western Sudoku Mission. And the pastor was telling me what he used to illustrate to the kids at the vacation Bible school. He had them raise their hand. How many Bibles do you have? You know, and he said, how many of you have a Bible? And then most of the kids raised their hand, right? How many have two Bibles in their home? And still a lot of the kids. And three. And more. Are they being read? Are they being cherished? Why? Because there is where you come to meet God. The name of God is revealing God to us. And what we have here in this passage is God revealing himself in an intimate way that we might know him and know him truly. That he is the God who provides. It used to be that, used to be, that we, we, we would talk about, you know, husbands being the main provider. I used to counsel that in premarital counseling. I said, I believe that's the biblical picture that's ordinary, you know, at least has been, but now it isn't so ordinary. You know, now both are providers because we've got to have more things, right? At least we think we do. I would always warn young people, I said, don't think you have to have things. And when you get a raise, don't think you need to spend more money to buy more things. You need to get more in debt. And then you've got to have more. It's an endless road. But we are blessed here with so much. And we are blessed with the word of God. And we need to pray that God would give us hearts to cherish it because that's where he speaks to us. That's where he's telling us here in this passage about himself that he has provided for us the greatest Savior, the only Savior. A reformed people, we believe in election and predestination, do we not? Of course we do. The Bible teaches it. But I also believe that Jesus is the only Savior for the world. And we can say Jesus is the Savior of the world. That is, if anyone is to be saved, it must be through Christ. That lesson was being taught to Abraham. And Abraham believed God. He was willing to take his only son as the only way. Because that's what God told him. And God is telling you and me the same. Right here this morning, we have it demonstrated to us in the Lord's Supper. You know what you're saying there. It's only Jesus. It's only his blood that is shed for me. Only his body. Isaiah would say it's by his stripes we are healed. That's a very personal you know, statement indeed. By his stripes. Oh. Abraham Lincoln once had a young mother come to him. Her son had been found guilty of dereliction of duty and was going to be put to death. And uh, she pleaded with him, you know, for the mercy of God. And he said, well, he's deserving of this punishment. And she said, yes, he is. I'm not asking for what he deserves. I'm asking for mercy. Mercy is that God gives us what we don't deserve. And he gave us Jesus Christ. Abraham didn't deserve to have that only son. He hooked up with his handmaiden and had a child trying to do his own thing. That wasn't God's way. And it's been trouble ever since. Division among humanity. But God here isn't asking Abraham to do something sinful either when it says it tested him. We began in verse 1. The New King James, I think, as it translates it correctly, it's saying that God tested Abraham. It's a test. He doesn't tempt anyone to sin. Scripture is clear about that. And God himself is never tempted by sin. Many years before, God had promised Abraham that he would have a son and that God would multiply that son into a great nation. That's what's being fulfilled here. But again, it's not through Abraham's son. It's through God's son. Abraham's son is going to be substituted because he never would have been good enough. 
All the men in the world could be sacrificed. Every child could be sacrificed and never satisfy the perfect justice of God. Only Jesus, because he was holy lamb, the perfect lamb, the spotless lamb that could take away the sins of the world. And so God's promise, I'm going to make you a great nation. But it was because Abraham believed God. See, we need Romans 4 helps us interpret that. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. And God was going to bring forth a promised redeemer. He was in the lineage of Abraham, Jesus, in his humanity. Yes, that is true. But that was not enough. And Abraham had ma waited many years for God to give him that son. And, and now he's grown into a teenager, young manhood. And you, know, you could think that all of Abraham's hopes were in that son as fathers are wont to do. And now God comes to him? This son in whom all the promises he's to see fulfilled and tells him to, to sacrifice that son. I'm like, what's going through Abraham's mind? The scriptures show us no hesitation on Abraham's part. Now we could, you know, get into fancy fanciful, you know, speculation about what he was thinking. Oh, how can this be done? How can God ask me? That's what the pagans do, offering human sacrifice. We don't do... He doesn't say any of that. The response of Abraham is, if that's what God has told me to do. You see him the next day, he got up, got everything together, and he went to do what God had told him to do. We need to pray for ourselves to be like that. And God brings it to us from Scripture something we need to do as well as believe. There's actions that are called for on our part too, and we need to do it. It just says, so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and he laid it on Isaac. And I said that in the Hebrew, it's very precise. He's being very meticulous. This was not a thrown together altar. I mean, he is serious about doing one. You know, in my family, they call they call me Pop Pop. I have 12 grandchildren now. And we just had our family camp. And they say, Pop Pop's the fire starter, right? I'm the one who builds the fires. You know? Well, you can do it the wrong way. It won't burn very well, you know. It needs to draft and all that, right? Well, Abraham is doing that. I mean, everything about what he is doing is in, as far as men can be, it's like in perfect conformity to God's will in this matter. He's not hesitating. And of course, Abraham is held up as an example to us, as a father of our faith. We are the children of Abraham by faith, not by physical connection, not because you live in the area of the east end of the Mediterranean, you know, where Israel is today. That doesn't make you a true Jew. It's you must be like Abraham and trust God's only sacrifice, and he is Jesus Christ. And the angel of the Lord called to him. Abraham's ready. He's got the knife. The two of them went together. Isaac said, Dad, what's happening here? I don't see a lamb. I see the wood, you know. I see the knife. I see the fire. What's going on? And he took that fire. Abraham said, my son, God will provide. Let's say that wasn't a blind faith that Abraham had. People are always talking that way. You know, especially if you talk people who are influenced by Roman Catholicism. You just got to have faith. Like it's, faith is this thing out here. And if I go get a box of it somewhere, I'll be okay. You know? Maybe Costco will give me a real good deal on it. It doesn't happen that way. Faith always has its object. And that object is Jesus Christ. God was telling Abraham, you do this, and Abraham was looking to the Lord. He'll provide. He's telling me to do it. That's all I need. I got the instructions. But it was not until Abraham had bound Isaac, laid him on a pillar, lifted the knife to slay him, at that 11th hour, when Abraham had considered his son, we might say, as good as dead, Nothing had restrained him right up to the moment. The knife is in his hand. He's ready to plunge it. Then 
the angel from heaven called to Abraham and said, Abraham, Abraham. You can also almost imagine a shout. And he says, here I am. This is the third time he said that, by the way, in this passage. The Hebrew, Hanani, here I am. Same word that young Samuel used when God was calling to him. Eli was so messed up, he couldn't even recognize the voice of God. But Samuel knew it, and he said, Hanani, here I am, Lord. Or Isaiah's call, here I am, Hanani, send me, Lord. That's the kind of response we need. I guess we could call it a Hanani faith, right? Here I am, Lord. You've got to pray for that. So here I am. And the angel said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for I know that you fear God. Fear, respect, it's not like just a shaking, trembling, like seeing a monster or something. That's the way, you know, commonly think of fear with children or fear of the dark or this. No, it's that tremendous blessing of having respect for God. It's a lack of respect in our day, in our generation, towards authority, towards parents, towards other people, towards elderly. Nothing like when I was a child. Because it's the lack of the fear of God. That's where it begins. What does the scripture say? The beginning of wisdom is where? In the fear of God. That's the beginning of wisdom. So it means to love him, to respect him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Anybody can say they love you, but how is that relationship then? You know? It's for I now know that you fear God since you have withheld your son, your only son. Now this word in providing, as he says, that Abraham knew God provided. Jireh means literally some word to see to it. To see to see. It's a compound in a sense. But it's like prevision, if you will. God knows our needs beforehand. Even before we come to him and appeal to him for what we need. It's because of God's prevision that you and I are able to make provision, right? <laughs> we use to provide for ourselves. How do we provide for ourselves? Because of God. And we give him the glory. We have nothing in this life unless he ordains it. Especially when it relates to our salvation here. He is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, the one who sees ahead. See, we don't have to worry about tomorrow. There's enough evil in the day. God says, I know what tomorrow is. You don't, but I do. And that should be a great comfort to us. Now, of course, we have human responses to things. He used to be a country singer. It was a Christian, Paul Overstreet. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He had a delightful song he sung about the devil giving him a tough time. He said, you know, you get up in the morning, you look out, and you just dug a well, and the devil came and filled it with dirt. Well, what in the world do you do about that? So get a shovel, dig some dirt. <laughs> That's what you do. God provided the shovel. God's given you strength to do it. You see, there's an interaction there. It's not, we're not, you know, just puppets on a string in that regard. He's made us to be true beings to serve him. And to follow him, Abraham believed God. Abraham had to get his son, had to get the wood, make the fire, build the altar, take the knife. All demonstrable of his faith. I mean, he didn't sit at home and say, well, I know the Lord take care of it. The Lord will provide. He ordains the means as well as the end. Well, God will save who he's going to save, yeah, by the preaching of the gospel. So you get out there and preach, teach. That's what he tells his church. And you witness. That's what the early church did. No, it turned the world around. God used them. Because everywhere they went, they spoke of Jesus. God will provide. And I know it's difficult in this life because we don't see the way God sees. We've got so many things affecting our vision. Last year I had cataract surgery on both my eyes. 
wow, I could see again. That's why I got these little readers, you know. It was so awesome. But God sees all things exhaustively. Nothing's going to catch him by surprise. And he's the one that will follow him. And he says he will provide for us. And yet all these fears come on us. Oh, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen about my children? I fear for my grandchildren. And I've got to pray about it. What kind of world are they going to grow up in? Not like when I was a boy in the 50s and we actually stood for the Pledge of Allegiance in school and I had the Ten Commandments on the wall in my room in a public school and my kindergarten teacher taught me to pray. That's not today, is it? But we have to point them to Christ and he will provide for them even in these things. Israel went into captivity a number of times. Two great times, but a number of times. And God provided for his people. And eventually provided a way out. There was a little girl once who lived in rural England. And she was getting an opportunity to travel for the first time in her life. In those days, it was all by train. Still is a lot of time. And going to the big city of London... And going there, you had, if you know England at all, there's a lot of hills and a lot of rivers and streams and bridges, old stone bridges, lovely stone bridges. And you had to cross those things. And she, she had never understood that. No one had told her about it. And she didn't understand how you could safely cross all these rivers. The river by her place could be frightful and flood at times. And so she's on the train, she's looking out the window and she's seeing the river coming close, and the train is going to head right over the river. What's going to happen? Her heart's beating fast, and suddenly there was a bridge, right? And the train went over the bridge. The bridge was provided so the train wouldn't crash. And then there was another one, and another one, and suddenly she calmed down about it, and that's kind of the way we go through life sometimes. We forget that God will build all the bridges we need that he who has begun a good work and you will complete it. He will provide what you need to sustain you. Hold on to him and no other. Look to Jesus, we're told. Keep your eyes fixed on him. Not on the world. It's passing. It's passing. Read history. Nations rise and fall. We may be at the end of our own, the way we're going. That's okay. Because the kingdom of God is forever and ever. The kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ is an everlasting kingdom. It's been secured by his very blood. That sacrifice that Abraham was to give, but in place came the lamb of sacrifice that God had provided, so God has provided for us. There's no greater th enemy than sin. Because the wages of sin is what? Death. We all know that. Paul says that's the great enemy we face. But praise be to God through Jesus Christ, who has made us more than conquerors. Not only read Philippians, you read the end of Romans 8 to get encouragement. There's nothing in heaven and earth that shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Why? Because He's Jehovah Jireh. He will provide. He will provide. You know, you ever ride on a train, Dr. Donald Barnhouse once used this illustration. I love it. His illustration, what life is like. And he, said, he was telling one of his children as they were traveling, he's a big train, train going on the track. He said, the train's like sin and death. You stand in front of that train, it's going to, ooh, you know, you don't make it. He said, but look, beside the train, there's a shadow following it. That's what death is like for you and me. You can stand right over there in that shadow, and you'll just pass through the shadow of death. It won't touch you. That's what God provides for you and me through our Lord Jesus Christ, who we're remembering today. And we remember he was that lamb. This promise he gave 
Abraham, I swear I will bless you. That was his promise. It's going to be a blessing beyond anything you could ever imagine or dream of. Your seed, the promised redeemer, the coming Christ, the savior of sinners will triumph over all enemies. For in thy seed shall all the nations. And yeah, I almost wish they would always translate it peoples. That's what nations are. We, we, often I think, we think of nations, we kind of think of the, the structure, right? We think of governments. And, no, the nations are the peoples. All the peoples of the earth shall be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. And so Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides its promise to provide a substitute to save Isaac's life and to provide power to fulfill all his promises to Abraham. And it's even greater for you and me, beloved. How significant it is when we turn in the New Testament and we hear John the Baptist, who has broken the silence of centuries between the Old and New Testaments. And he's that prophet who would come and he says, the one I'm coming to prepare the way for, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And yet he was given that great privilege. Behold, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice provided by God to take away the sin of the world. And so we have that very significant statement here. In Genesis 22, 14, where we read that Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And it was on that mount centuries later that the Lamb of God provided by God to take away the sin of the world was crucified for you and me. In the mount of the Lord, he shall be provided. In that place where Abraham set up a memorial and called it Jehovah Jireh, the Lord you're provided, your provider. God provided a lamb, a sacrifice to take our place, to bear our sins, to save us from the death that threatened us, eternal death. You know, how grateful are we for new medicines? And we're longing for more new medicines to be made. You know, there's some breakthroughs that are coming about Alzheimer's disease. That will be marvelous. And even some about cancer. They're talking about a, a cancer vaccine. And, uh, you know, things that, they're wonderful. I mean, I was a, a polio child in, in that sense. All my siblings got polio except for me. So I'm not an anti-vaxxer. You know, when they handed out the little sugar cubes in school, in the public school, we all got in line, we took them. And I got smallpox vaccination, you know. Many lives were saved. But that's another story. But here's the greatest. Here's the greatest news you can tell someone. God has provided a Savior for your sin. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. If you could see my heart, it would be most ugly. You'd be just reprehensible I don't stand here with holiness in and of myself it's of the Lord righteous through faith in Jesus and he alone clothes me clothes you that's the message we can bear to the world to all these homeless people now California's got the largest population of homeless in the country I don't know how many thousands hundreds of thousands they need Christ. Yeah, many of them, they're there because of their own sin. Hey, I was there because of my own sin. And if Jesus hadn't lifted me out of that miry pit and set my feet on a solid rock, I wouldn't be here today. I was, someone told me about that God will provide you a Savior, and he is Jesus. That's the message we tell them. What's church all about? Come here and learn of Jesus, the Savior that he'll save you from your sins. And that's why we're here, and that's why we have, we're having fellowship together about that, because we're Christians. 
because we believe God in that promise. Amen? Amen. So I want to encourage your hearts here, okay? This is like, you ever see that movie, Ice Station Zebra? Oh, it's, you go up there in the Arctic. How do people live there all year long? Well, this, this is like an ice station in that world. This is a place of shelter. You know, when we talk about being in Christ, that's what we hope to see here. Not just being in church, but in Christ. And then no matter where they go, no matter what the storms are, no matter what the trials, God will provide because they're in Jesus. So I want to encourage you to stay excited about that message. And anyone who comes and visits, you know, you know if they're half naked, give them some clothes and put them in the front seat. One time in Sacramento, we had a guy who came in and took his clothes off. The deacons had to take him out, you know. But he came back a few weeks later and apologized. So, and they, they welcomed him back. That's what you do. Do you want God ever to close the door on you? I don't think so. I don't think so. We'll, don't forget, that is a good passage. As Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. We are welcome to come to Christ. Call all men to come to Christ. Who are you and I to determine whether or not they're going to be saved? We don't know that. That's not our business. Our business is to tell them about the one who has saved us and that they too might be saved. I said, might? I don't know who God is saving. I'm surprised by it sometimes. It's like when they when. George Whitfield was asked if he thought he would see John Wesley in heaven, because Wesley was always speaking against Whitfield, preaching about predestination. And Whitfield's response is, I don't know. He'll be so close to the Lord that I'll be blinded by the glory of God, and I may not be able to see him. <laughs> so it is. Seeing then, listen to these wonderful words where we come to the Lord's Supper here from Hebrews seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus the son of God let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but in all points was tempted as we are yet without sin and God laid his son on that altar. And the Hebrews says that he entered once into the Holy of Holies with his own blood. Once to satisfy for our sins, to make atonement a covering. Trust Jesus. Love him. Pray that God would magnify that love in your heart and mind. Only he can do that. Only he can work that. And he will do that. If we are faithful to draw nigh unto him, we are told he will draw nigh unto us. The problem is we draw back or we turn away. May God draw our hearts always to the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. Let us pray.